you to tell us more about this interesting project. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me and that we have better success with the technology. And that goes now it's good. Sure. So I can hear <laughs> you. That's so, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, thank you for the introduction. Uh, this uh, presentation is uh, really about a pilot project to explore an electric hydrofoil ship in public transport. And I'd like to start with the words of this uh, familiar person. I think you all uh, recognize him. He said that uh, we cannot possibly solve today's big problems with the same mindset that created them. So what does that mean? And I like to address it to the mindset of having too many preconceived notions about how things are and how they work. We, we seem to know how things should work because we look back how it is working right now. And sometimes it's really hard for us to believe in another way of doing things that we experience as, as the reality right now. I, th I think it's a uh, good words to bring along when you work with innovation. And uh, also you probably all know about this uh, curve, that adoption to new technologies. It's uh, often appears when you talk about uh, new technology or gadgets or different digital solutions. And I think each of us as individuals, I think it's quite easy to position ourselves in, in this curve. If we really <laughs> are a, an innovator and an adopter, or if we like to wait a little bit to uh, try things later on when it's accepted on the market. Uh, however, however, what about us as the public transport authority? Which role should we really have? It's a complex situation. Uh, I will start with a brief background story about this project. Uh, Michelle already mentioned some targets and challenges uh, with uh, emissions. Uh, what I want to show here is a difference in grams per passenger kilometer compared to bus. It's quite huge actually. As you can see in 2019 at least it was 422 grams compared to 34 grams in the bus. Uh, to railways of course it's even bigger but I'm not showing that here. It's, it's most, most relevant to compare to a bus solution in this case. And in the bus sector development has gone faster as there are several sustainable technologies already on the market. Uh, you know most about them probably. Uh, for the maritime sector it's not yet that developed and uh, I guess a lot of us here in this seminar today are working quite heavily to make this happen. But some uh, uh, measures uh, has been implemented during the years uh, such as echo driving training, uh, retrofitting to hybrid propulsion systems and also as Michelle mentioned the use of HVO to a quite large extent. Um, the share of uh, renewable fuels in public transport in Stockholm uh, has also been in a shift uh, quite rapidly in the bus sector and reached about 96% in 2019. And uh, there's a mix of technologies behind that achievement. The maritime transportation has shifted slower. It was 18% in 2019, but we actually reached a milestone in 2020 by having 50% renewable fuels, mostly by adding HVO. Uh, so we are quite, or moving quite rapidly, at least now, towards the targets. And also, Michelle mentioned some targets. Uh, 2030 is kind of a stepping stone to between 2045 and uh, Looking at some emissions here, we uh, have a target to, to reach 75% reduction of nitrogen oxides and particles, and also to shift into 100% of fossil free fuels in the maritime sector as well. And uh, a reduction of energy use shall decrease with 15% at the same time. So, uh, with, with all of this, uh, uh, factors, we, there's definitely some room for innovation. <clears throat> some characteristics of our tonnage and the maritime transport system. <clears throat> uh, 
the archipelago that Michelle already talked about, it's, it's a very beautiful place that a massive amount of people like to visit during the summer. Uh, and uh, as you know, the summer isn't that long here in Sweden. And quite often during this short time, the ships are fully loaded with passengers, with luggage, with cargo, some pets, or whatever people want to bring along. And everybody's aiming to reach different locations on these islands. There are many of islands and various reasons. It could be going to the beach, going to the summer house, to a restaurant for the night, going for work, or many people just cruise around the archipelago for a day. So there's quite a few different needs during the summer. Uh, but the scenario drastically changed during the low season when many of these destinations are not that attractive anymore. And this means we experience quite significant fluctuations in the utilization of the vessels. And also uh, in the winter time, we still need to operate the public transport as are people living in these islands and so they, they need to travel. Uh, some frequency in routes to these islands, it's not easy to solve this task. Uh, some winters there is also the presence of ice, quite thick ice, making it even harder to reach some of these islands. And not all of the ships can break through thick ice and we even need to use hovercraft sometimes to reach some islands and even helicopters too when it's uh, really special reasons. Of course you understand this is quite quite expensive for us to solve this during the whole year. Uh, Commuter vessels, they are more stable in utilization. They move shorter distances and, and they are part of the daily routines for, for some people going to work uh, <coughs> daily. Still, they represent quite a low share of the total amount of passengers in the overall public transportation system. But maybe this can change in the future. Who knows? Because there is some potential Definitely, and there is a hypothesis that we work with. Um, maritime transport and the seaways has the potential to offer both a more attractive route and shorter travel times than land-based alternatives. Not only because of traffic jams that you see here in the picture, only, but also because there's a longer route to drive around islands over bridges and go around different bays and things. So there are actually longer routes uh, going by car or bus or rail, if there's not a tunnel, of course. Uh, also, the waterways can have a quite significant relieving effect uh, on the system in general, which could help us during peak hours when there is a crowd in the public transport system. Uh, between the peak hours, it's a more uh, fair way of using the space in these uh, solutions. It's not that crowded. Um, as mentioned earlier, also by Michelle, my colleague, there are some challenges with conventional ships. Uh, they consume quite a lot of energy due to the water displacement. Uh, and the creation of waves from this displacement is a problem causing land erosion and the rocking of boats that are moored to jetties. Yeah. There's also, of course, the pollutions from emissions from combustion engines and also, in some cases, disturbing noise from uh, the machinery. Yeah. Maintenance time and cost of these uh, conventional ships and vessels is always a challenge. It's affecting time planning and uh, uh, effectivity and things like this. So there is uh, definitely some room for innovation and, and that's why pilot projects like this get started. We uh, summarized a couple of drivers for innovation in this project. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, creation of swell is a cause for speed limitations in the waterway uh, and that has a negative impact on the travel time. Meaning, if we could go faster and not create waves, we could possibly make a faster travel time and a more attractive route. Also mentioned before, the fluctuation in the utilization of the tonnage is very expensive and ineffective. Uh, very crowded in the summer, not so crowded in the winter. And emissions is an obvious concern, of course. 
Before I move on to the actual project, uh, I'd like to show you a chapter of the innovation strategy that Radio Stockholm has. Um, we shall collaborate with external actors by offering high quality test and demonstration environments when there is a clear operational and user benefit. These test environments must also be available for employees' innovations. So it means that we should try to seek corporations when it's possible and also encourage the employers to come up with their own ideas from basically internal work. Uh, it's uh, quite popular to, for the employees here to suggest ideas to work with and then they could get the small innovation support to make it happen. And also uh, by trying out different ideas in a pilot project, valuable information is obtained before deciding on permanent implementation to further develop innovations and stimulate regional growth. Remuneration and financing models may need to be developed when the solutions are to be introduced. So meaning if we try out innovations that challenge old ways, it could be necessary to also look at policies and different financing models in the future. So moving on to the actual pilot pro pro project here, uh, there was an opportunity uh, to explore an innovation. Uh, some new technology is available through Candela Speedboat and there was a possibility to apply for a co-financing for a project from the Swedish Transport Administration. They have a research and innovation program there, uh, which we applied to. Uh, just want to mention here also that we had autonomous operation in the scope initially, but in discussions with uh, the Swedish Transport Administration, it was discontinued. Uh, basically for the reason that the project would be too broad uh, in content. I mean, the, the scope would be a little bit too big. But this is something that could be uh, investigated in the future, definitely. So maybe you have seen it already, uh, the electric hydrofoil day cruiser from Candela. Uh, they are a company based here in Stockholm. Uh, used to be a startup, but probably now slowly becoming a scale-up uh, with all the attention they get and, and the popularity of the leisure boat they have. Um, nevertheless, with uh, their will to achieve even bigger things and to do some real impact in the shift to zero emission vessels, they want to expand the product portfolio and scale up the technology into larger crafts such as vessels for public transport, charter or other commercial operations. So what is new to this technology really? Well, the first hydrofoil is considered born already in 1861 by an English engineer called Thomas Moy, who installed a set of wings on his boat and noticed a lift as the vessel was towed. So the hydrofoil itself isn't really that new. Um, Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, uh, was the first to do some real experimental trials already in 1908. Uh, and here on the picture you see the model HD4, which he managed to raise in about 62 knots already back in 1919. I think it was a record for crafts on, on water at that time. Uh, and as I, far as I know, the process of landing the whole ship on the surface after this speed was a little bit of a problem. Uh, but I think that problem has been solved now uh, in more modern uh, ships with hydrofoils. Uh, both military context and public transport has tried out hydrofoils during the years. But not with electric propulsions and not with the widely developed sensor technology and flight control that Candela has developed. Uh, here you see the leisure boat that we have in operation today and also a chart about energy efficiency uh, considering uh, the amount of passenger and range. Uh, what you can see here uh, is that Candela represents the blue dots and uh, comparable fleet or vessel is the red dots and you can see the passenger count on the, on the lower scale. So at least now it seems like this technology of Candela is mostly effective 
up to maybe 150 people or something and then the benefit of this technology kind of fades out a little bit it's still it, it is still more effective as a technology but definitely the biggest impact is on smaller vessels after 50 people you can see there's quite a lot of energy savings being made even up to 100 so uh, the project is started and you might have seen this already uh, on the internet because there was some news about this project started this is an early design sketch of the the vessel and it's called p30 right now uh, it is not a final design it's important to mention this uh, the engineers at candela and, and our team within the pda are working with the requirements and specifications right now so it's definitely subject to change before it's finally leaving the shipyard in late next year. Um, but to summarize, it's it's really a, a high-tech vehicle. And, and uh, also from our side, we hope to try out some new IT concept as well. We'll see if it's fitting the budget or not. There, there might be some opportunities to try some new concept and experiment on them. Uh, several functions are mandatory to fulfill to be able to operate as a public transport vessel. And there are some rules that we require uh, to be fulfilled before put into traffic under our flag. Um, and also, of course, the project aims to do a proper evaluation. And to do this evaluation, we need many data. We want to compare the P30 to conventional ships where it's applicable. Uh, and also for Candela's matter, they want to validate the technology and ship design in professional use as, as it, it is different to the leisure use case that they have experienced from the Candela 7 leisure boat. It is really something else for the machinery and, and, and the whole ship to operate as a professional ship in public transport. Um, this ship has several sensors that can supply all the data we need uh, and then it will be up to us to analyze and draw conclusions from it um, and we can basically follow everything that happens on upon this this uh, ship but of course from engine rpms and temperatures uh, activity in gyroscopes and energy consumptions from different parts of the system we will basically be able to follow and track everything and cross-check that to positioning data and time trackings. So we, we hope to be able to find out how the ship really performs in, in some specific route. So collecting data, uh, finding out what really happened during operation, and then to summarize that in the, in, in the very end. Also uh, charging sequence, uh, as it runs on battery, it, it will, it will be a very important part to follow us. Uh, it will have a strong impact on the time schedule uh, on, on this vessel if it would be a future solution for us. Um, how long time does it need to charge? When should it charge? And one challenge for us as a region is where, where can it actually charge? The electrical power grid infrastructure in the archipelago uh, and even some central jet is has some limitations when it comes to capacity. I think you all have followed the debates and challenges on, on the land side where charging places uh, for personal cars also needs to be developed. Uh, in the maritime sector it's not that developed at all so that's a challenge. But for the project we we plan to use uh, what is already there so we, we're not planning to uh, have some new charging locations installed. Also, ticketing. Um, ticketing is a quite important factor. Uh, of course, it's it's affecting the effectivity of the boarding and offboarding. Uh, if you save time on on travel time, uh, that's one thing. But if we lose a lot of time uh, boarding the vessel, offboarding the vessel, uh, we kind of lose a lot of the benefits of, of a faster travel time. So we will see what we can do with that as well. Um, 
selecting the route it's something that we are working on right now and uh, we of course did some uh, pre-studies on potential routes uh, before we applied for the project of course but uh, now that we know that the project will be able to uh, be executed we need to do a deeper analysis of this and, and really look into cross-checking the specifications of the vessel and finding the areas for dispensations from speed limits we need to apply uh, to be able to go faster uh, than it is allowed uh, a lot of these dispensations are cause of waves making land erosion also uh, we uh, uh, are mapping the charging infrastructure uh, on every jetty that the, the vessel should uh, dock along the way. Uh, and also looking at the jetty specifications. Uh, there is a tide difference in, in Sweden as well. It, it, it's not that, that large. I mean, the difference in water height, it's, it, it's shifting, of course, but uh, not as much as on other locations in Europe. But uh, we need to consider it. Uh, it's a rather small boat. Uh, so being able to uh, dock every jetty is a little bit of a challenge as well. Um, just one little glance at the time plan. Uh, as I mentioned, this year we are working with the requirements and specifications. Uh, after the summer next year, um, Candela will do hopefully some sea trials. And, and test everything and also make sure to get the certifications and everything needed for the uh, vessel to be approved. Uh, the second quarter of 2023, we will uh, hopefully start to operate it in traffic and uh, welcome passengers on board this, this uh, ship. And then we hope to run for about a year, maybe not every day, but we hopefully can try out in different conditions. Uh, both the lake of Mälaren and also in the sea. And of course, we want to try it in bright sunshine, quite uh, nasty storms and winter climates and everything that we can, can try during this year. Uh, if anybody wonders if it can go through ice, the answer is no. So that is a challenge not only for the pilot, it's, it's a challenge for a future uh, solution to, to a system with this kind of ships. But uh, we are very happy to have the possibility to try this and, and to follow it. And, and uh, we hope to deliver an interesting report in a couple of years for everybody to read. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Tobias, for these presentations. Are there questions okay um not yet um so um i understand that uh, you will have an extensive evaluation and an evaluation report in 2024 ready will this report also be available and published then if someone is uh, interested to follow your project or yes is this definitely for internal use no it will be definitely a published uh, report uh, it's one of the requirements from uh, Tafik Verket who is also financing the project so it will definitely be an, an official report in, in the very end uh, with with uh, some data and hopefully some conclusions uh, about that. Okay. I understood that um, this hydrofoil technology it uh, enables to have less swell and then higher speeds in areas which are kind of usually uh, with speed limits in the archipelago. Um, so if you look at it, not only from a strategic point of view, and uh, not only from a technological, but a strategic point of view, um, is part of your pilot also to have a look into uh, in which way also, I would say, new lines uh, could be operated and make use of this combination, which is quite a change, I would say, compared to the ships that you have in operation today. 
Yes, definitely. So uh, there is, when working with pilot projects in general, it's really important to consider how do we design the test to get enough data to evaluate and to draw conclusions. And um, so which scenario and which route the test actually do doesn't has to really be the same thing as a future future uh, route or some conclusion we make to make a new route. So, um, because there is a challenge, if we, if we would try, for instance, like a new route that doesn't exist today, uh, from a political point of view, it's not really that smooth to do it because then we are showing a new line and if, it's, if it starts to become really popular, then we take it away again after the, the end of the test. So, so, so we hope to learn enough uh, on existing routes uh, to plan for maybe opening up a new one, so to say. So during the pilot, uh, we will operate in already existing routes, uh, but hopefully in a mix of archipelago and the lake. Um, but it's not really decided yet. It, it's a bit complicated to find out all the proper dispenses that we need and those things. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we have a question also here from um, the chat, a little bit going into the overall um, perspective again. Um, so you also mentioned uh, retrofit. So the question is, is there also other plans or maybe also already examples to modify all diesel ferries into electric ferries uh, in Stockholm? I am not the best person to answer that. I know it has been done, but it could be also initiatives from the operators to do it themselves, uh, really. Uh, and from our side, uh, in most cases, we are not really uh, deciding on technology shifts. We do it together in discussions with operators and things. It has been done, but maybe Gustav Mirstein hopefully can uh, answer that better than me. <laughs> Okay, so we get back to this question after the next presentation, maybe. Are there further questions at the moment? Okay, then thank you, Tobias, for the time being. So maybe after Gustav's presentation, there will be further questions also to you.